So welcome to our webinar today. My name is Elena Marco. I'm the European Marketing Manager for the Ischemic Disease in Striker. And we, I want to really thank you for your time and the participation today. And thank you to all our speakers who prepared these great presentations and discussions. The webinar series that we are uh, producing are the goal is to have the exchange between physicians, even in this time where we cannot travel. I hope we can start traveling really heavily early uh, after the summer. And the webinar of today is about getting patients to TK3. Uh, discuss different topics from diagnostic to communication, to the treatment, to periprocedural medical treatments. So you have a, a broad overview of how to get patients into a better outcome. During this, we are trialing different platforms for webinars to try to in improve the experience from audi uh, our audience and, and, and you, all of you. And you will see that ye, the best way to connect to these webinars is through Google Chrome. And if you have any technical issue, the best thing to do is to refresh your browser and then you will reconnect and have better quality. In your screen, you will find on the left a Q&A function Please use the function to interact with uh, our audience, ask your technical questions or your, or your clinical questions to our audience, and they will answer to you written or directly to all the audience if the, if the question is broad enough. Um, you will be asked during the, the webinar some pull questions, some uh, questions to just introduce the different topics Please participate like this. We can have a little bit more discussion and, and have more interaction between the audience and the speakers. There is some additional content added into the right of your screen with some information about the speakers today, the agenda, and some of our striker offering. And without any more, I'd like to introduce our moderator today, which is uh, Professor Urs Fischer from the Neurology Department of uh, Insel Hospital, moving very soon, and he will take us further in the program today. Yes, thank you very much, Elena, and uh, good evening, everybody. So it's my great pleasure to be the chairman of this session, and we have four excellent and great speakers. And the overall arching technique uh, topic is how we can improve reperfusion. Uh, as you probably know, patients in acute ischemic stroke should be treated as soon as possible and as good as possible. But despite the all advantages we have done in the past, still 40% of acute ischemic stroke patients with large vessel occlusion show a non-complete reperfusion after mechanical thrombectomy. And we know that there is a strong association between the reperfusion grade achieved and also functional outcome. And also patients with TIKI-3 have a significant better outcome than patients with a TIKI-2B. So the, the current guidelines say we should try to improve reperfusion as good as possible, but also as safe as possible. But the question is, how can we do it right? How can we achieve TIKI-3 in all our patients with an acute ischemic stroke? We will discuss about the right patient, the right place, and the right uh, treatment, and also the right technique today. So it is my great pleasure to introduce the first speaker uh, today. It's Professor Martin Kurman, and he's very well known. He's a deputy chairman of the Department of Neurology and professor for clinical stroke research in Essen in Germany. He's the head of the S Neurovascular Unit, and he has published more than 200 papers uh, in neurovascular research. His main interest is acute uh, ischemic stroke, but also neurovascular ultrasound. He is editor of several journals, and he has received several awards. And especially, he's a long-standing fellow of the European Stroke Organization. So, Martin, thank you very much for your presentation. Yes, uh, thanks, Urs. Hello to everyone uh, back home. Unfortunately, we cannot uh, meet in person still. So um, I think we start with the poll question to communicate with your team which media are you using. So send your answer here. I'm not really sure how long we will wait for the polls come in. So, 
That's good old phone. Are there still are there answers coming in? <laughs> Can we already go to the next slide or? Great. Okay. So 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 I'm going to offer uh, you some some other um, ways of communicating with you and with your team and probably also with the ambulance. I will show you some work that we have done in Essen, also some work that was done in, in others. And as Urs says, our, our major goal is to bring patients to TK3, but I actually will start right before the intervention because the, the biggest obstacle these days is how we can organize our stroke care with all these new opportunities, with all these new possibilities that we have with thrombectomy, with treatment and extended time windows. I think that the major issue in the next uh, few years will be how can we organize our stroke care in order to get the patient to the right place and uh, in, in, in a timely, timely manner. Um, so we're still, oh, we're going back to that. Oh, there, there are still, uh, there are all uh, other possibilities also. So I will come back to that. So, so as I said, I think one of the major challenges will be uh, to get the patient to the right place in the first place, even before we can talk about from back to me and, uh, and, and all the other treatments uh, and new chances that, that you will hear in this session. And I think it's really time to uh, restructure our networks, to rethink our uh, treatment of stroke and our street, uh, treatment uh, targets. Actually, in the former times, uh, the, the, the main goal was to, to open up as many stroke units as we can, as we can get. Um, still switching my slides, it's not me. Um, as you can see in Germany, we really achieved a, a great, great thing with over 300 stroke units. You can see the green spots um, uh, with uh, mainly from back to me capable centers and then the red spots, uh, regional stroke units that will transfer patients from uh, through from back to me. And it's, it's pretty clear that we have to come a long way to, to have a nice network in Germany. But, but as you can see, there are still some spots where there's under coverage, but there are also spots, and I'm actually located in that area here, where we probably have already reached um, over coverage. And that's exactly the main issue that we have. We have to organize our networks in order to get the patients that need from back to me to the from back to me centers while not over flooding those centers with patients that probably are well off uh, being treated in, in, the, in the smaller stroke unit. As you can see, there is a lot of different regions with different issues. So the problem is in all that, that there's one way in every region, but it's certainly not the same way in all regions. So that's why we have to talk about a lot of uh, trials that we have to do, a lot of organization in your own networks in order to find the right pathway in, in your region. And now we already have great, uh, great data and uh, some of our friends uh, from Barcelona, the great team, did a very nice trial in a, in a, in a large region. Yeah. You can see um, uh, Catalonia here, and uh, this was presented the last two ICs by uh, Marc Ribot and his team. And this was a race cat uh, study, as I said, in, in the region of Catalonia, where there are very little uh, from back to me units, all located in Barcelona region. And there are certain hubs that are, uh, that are located outside. So actually transfer times are quite uh, long in that region uh, at some times. And what they did is to randomize patient between going to the local area, to local stroke unit first, and then being transferred to the, uh, to, to the comprehensive stroke center in case of uh, uh, possibility to, to do thrombectomy. And they uh, randomized against going directly um, to the hub. And uh, the results were presented uh, on the last two ICs, as I said. And whenever I show that to some colleagues, it's, it's, it's very interesting to see because as you can see, the result is that by, uh, by local transfer, you have a higher rate of, uh, uh, of IVT, um, which is also done faster. But obviously, you lose around 10% of patients that could go for thrombectomy uh, if they go to direct, uh, to directly to the comprehensive stroke unit. And obviously, treatment is a little bit delayed um, also going to the, uh, to the local stroke unit. And 
whenever I show that to someone who's really, you know, uh, in favor of doing IVT, they say, well, earlier treatment in more than 10% more of patients will do the job. And if you talk to enthusiasts of thrombectomy, they say, well, no matter what, if you gain 10% of, uh, of uh, interventional treatment, this will certainly do the job and will be much more superior. And as you can see in the results, actually there is uh, the, the, um, the overall functional outcome of all these patients is pretty similar in both. But we have already seen some of the subgroup uh, analyses um, in this year's ISC, I will not go into detail, which shows the beauty of this, of this data that we have, that we can now actually look into subgroups that may benefit from direct transfers, such as patients that cannot receive IV thrombolysis but can receive from back to me. And I think we will uh, hear a lot more about these data um, from the Barcelona group in, in the future. But one subgroup that was already presented and that leads uh, to the project that we did actually in Essen is that if the transfer, the direct transfer is uh, less than 60 minutes or even much less than that, then there seems to be a superiority of bringing the patient um, uh, with a high race score in that, uh, in that instance directly to the comprehensive uh, stroke center where they can go for from back to me directly. So patients within a smaller region, within a more densely populated uh, region with uh, transfer times that are less than 60 minutes seems to benefit from, from direct transfer. That actually leads to the, the study that we did here in Essen using our digital platform, the joint platform, and that's the team that was involved in, in all that. And the main person is in the middle. He's the head of our fire department, and the fire department in Essen runs the whole EMS service. So that, that's a very good situation because we have just one EMS uh, service uh, running uh, the whole um, uh, in the whole city of Essen, and this is our neuroradiology department, that's the neurology de uh, department. And actually, our idea was, and we are now switching between slides. Um, I didn't do anything. So our idea was um, to look at the, at the coverage of our city, and that's now the city of Essen. And as you can see, we have basically four stroke units. We are also surrounded by a lot of stroke units in our region, but those are the four stroke units um, covering Essen, a city, one is in the north, one is in the south, and then there are two in the middle, and both in, of, uh, both in the middle are uh, thrombectomy capable centers, pretty, pretty close to each other. And actually, what uh, usually happens right now um, in, in Essen, if, if you have your stroke, you basically go to the first stroke unit that you can reach, and then if some, uh, if, if Diagnostics show that you can go further for thrombectomy, you get a secondary transport. And obviously the idea in such a short distance, and this will take probably 10 to 15 minutes uh, transfer time, um, if at all, would be actually to go directly with a subgroup of patients into the uh, thrombectomy capable center, and if needed, um, transferring the patient in the other direction uh, afterwards. And uh, one thing that we really have to mention is that in in, in our times now, these secondary transports of patients that uh, get first treatment in the local uh, hospitals have increased largely, not only in stroke, but also in other diseases. So there's a lot of specialization going on in the city and a lot of secondary transports, and those are actually the numbers. So this, the, the transport, the needed transports in our city increased more than 10,000 by more than 10,000 each year. So that's more than 10% increase of needed transports. Um, and that's mainly due to secondary inter-hospital transfers. And I think um, the, the fire department had to buy new cars every year in the past years. And um, that's becoming really a difficult situation because it's sometimes tough to get uh, transports uh, um, in, in our city. So that's it huge need, not only for medical reasons, but also for resources um, in, uh, to, to, to save on these, uh, on these uh, uh, transports. And then there's the data, and that's also coming from the region uh, here, directly around Essen. And obviously those are data from 2016, so everything has improved ever since. But as you can see, even in these densely populated areas, 
you lose a lot of time by, trans by secondary transports. And you see the delay of treatment even in such a region uh, like uh, our region here is more than one and a half hours. And that's, I think everyone knows that from clinical routine, um, it's, it's, it has improved ever since, but it's still, it's still a problem. That, despite the fact that uh, in these secondary transports, obviously the, the thrombectomy unit is already pre-notified and uh, does already know that there's an incoming thrombectomy and can assemble all the engine team and save at that time more than 40 minutes of intra-hospital time in, in order uh, when they're pre-notified that such a patient is coming in. And actually that was, that was one of the reasons where we said, well, well let's uh, take the best of two worlds. Um, so let's do the communication to our ambulance services and just save the secondary transport and by the same time pre-notify us that a patient with, uh, uh, with a, a high probability of um, of a proximal occlusion is incoming into e our ER and basically at the same time also saving such uh, some of the intra-hospital time um, by being pre-notified. We started with a retrospective study actually looking for the best score to use in, in, in our region. We used our uh, large uh, stroke database and looked uh, through three and a half thousand patients retrospectively and looked through all the scores available, available for um, for pre-hospital evaluation of large vessel occlusions, and um, that was the race score that the um, that the friends from Barcelona used, and we actually came up with the fast ED score, and that was at uh, the end modified and and basically organized to to work in, in an app that uh, the ambulance services uh, can use uh, out in the field. And um, when we did this validation study, we already saw that by using this fast DD score with a, with a value of four and a half, uh, of, of four and above, um, we, can, we would be able to cover most of the uh, proximal vessel occlusion. That was the idea for the Essence STAR study where we equipped our ambulance services that were actually deciding to go to our, uh, to our university hospital. We equipped them um, with military standard uh, cell phones um, that were running uh, the fast ED app that I will show you in, in a second. And as I said, we didn't want to change patients' pathway in these trials, but we want, just wanted to evaluate our, our approach. And by the same time, using this app, we had the possibility to do video and uh, audio communication out in the field. So the emergency services on the scene uh, could also call us to video uh, calls with us and pre-notify us um, with the fast ED on, on the condition of the patient. I will just take you through that. Obviously, this is in German. I will translate main, uh, most of that. So that, that's the joint triage app that we constructed together with, with uh, the company, um, which is uh, you know, custom made for, for, for Essen. You enter the unique uh, patient identifier and then the age, time of symptom onset, you uh, click yourself through uh, the fast ED um, scores, and then you will get a result. And what you then do is to transfer that in the main communication app, the join app that we are, are using. And from that time on, we are actually pre-notified. We know the score uh, of the patient. We know the age and time of symptom onset, and we can even track the patient in the ambulance service uh, through the city of Essen. And the beauty of that is that um, this information not only comes to one person that is pre-notified by, um, by telephone from the EMS and then has to deliver all the news to the, to the whole team, but um, in our case, using this communication app, the whole team that is needed to treat the patient is notified at the same time. And actually, when the patient is, um, is in, um, everyone in the team can already see uh, the, the, the imaging of the, um, of the patient and uh, be on the same page and we can also communicate through this app and see all the images, can see all the results and can also transmit that. And that was a very important feature of, of the whole project and also give feedback um, to the ambulance service. And um, now you can see how um, this, uh, this images turn up. I'm not really sure if you can see the video now. I can't. Um, ah, here, 
So now you can actually see um, how that looks in, in the app. You can see the, a, a patient with a wake-up stroke. You can already see in the, in the non-contest CT that the right hemisphere um, shows early infarct signs. Um, everyone can look at the CTA um, directly. You can do that from all over the world. You can see the M1 occlusion, and we already also built in um, our automated perfusion software that will give you also the values of, uh, of mismatch in that case, of missing mis mismatch. Obviously, this patient was uh, not treated um, with his uh, wake-up stroke. He was also uh, quite old, so um, we decided against treatment. And, and as I said, one of the major importances is that we can give direct feedback to the emergency uh, services, to the ambulance services. This is also in German. We actually tell them that they detected large vessel occlusion correctly, and they can also ask, so how did the intervention work in this patient? Um, this was a different patient where we did thrombectomy, as we told the, uh, the ambulance services. So it, that's a, a very unique feature that also the ambulance services have uh, feedback. And that, those are the results from the pilot trial that we did, uh, 200 patients as a positive control. You can see that um, it, it works. So at least the age is, uh, is highly correlated to the correct age, but also the fast ED that um, the, the ambulance services, uh, the first reactors um, actually uh, uh, told us was a very uh, good and very good correlation with the one that we actually saw on admission. Obviously, it cannot be 100% because in some patients, as you can see in 16 patients, there was uh, improvement or worsening. Obviously, then the fast CD out in the field will not be the same fast CD that we do in, uh, in, in our emergency room. But, as you can see, um, you have almost 100% of large vessel occlusion covered um, by using different cutoffs. And uh, the test quality is, is very good, even if the test is done by the emergency personnel, which, um, which is doing that with the app out, out in the field. And um, some of the um, bycatch actually um, is, is not really bycatch, because those would be patients that would be transferred anyway. Um, so as you can see, ICH also obviously shows up in higher in higher fast CD scales, um, and and will also be usually secondarily transferred. And so that's the hypothetical results of our trial that we that we've done. So if we calculate a scenario, which is basically what we are doing right now, so uh, patients with uh, with stroke are getting transferred to the nearest stroke unit, and if they have a fast CD of above four. Um, uh, and severe, uh, or if they have a severe ICH or a large vessel occlusion, any large vessel occlusion with any LVO that gets secondary transferred. And if we calculate that hypothetically to a scenario B in the future, um, where you would transfer patients with a modified uh, fast ED score of four and above directly um, to, the, to the comprehensive stroke unit and only transfer those with LVO and less than four um, secondarily, then you will come up with a number needed of, uh, to treat, uh, to screen of uh, actually five to avoid one secondary transfer and actually seven to avoid, uh, to, to reach one earlier um, uh, EVT. And that's obviously something that needs to be tested in the future. It's obviously not a good trial to do during a pandemic. So we are right now waiting in order to get this randomized trial uh, started. Obviously, we are not doing that uh, right now. But my conclusion is, it's a real challenge. It will be a real challenge. You will hear about a lot of advances that we reached in stroke care, but we really have to make sure to be best organized to get as many patients as possible to reach the TP3. And that starts with getting them to thrombectomy. Um, and with that, I thanks for your attention. Yeah, Martin, thank you very much for this excellent uh, presentation. It was really uh, to the point, and I very much appreciate also uh, your study, uh, which you did. Uh, just to the audience, please be aware there is a Q&A session. And uh, so uh, if you have any questions, please type it in so that we can ask uh, the speakers uh, afterwards uh, your question. Let me start with the first question. Um, you have uh, done uh, a lot of uh, uh, these kind of, you know, 
know, you looked at the scenario in your area, and often it's a lot about politics. Are you in touch with the other hospitals? Is there competition? Is there even fight among hospitals for the right patients? Or how is the procedure in your uh, catchment area? Yes, you're totally right. I mean, that's a huge political issue. That's why we started in our pilot trial not disrupting anything. So, um, so we decided to run this trial only in patients that were directed to go to our hospital. And we are now in the transition phase. I mean, everyone here knows about the study, about the outline of the study, but we have not started the process of, of discussing the randomized trials with the other centers because, as I said, I mean, we, we, we finished with the pilot trial last year. It's not the time of a pan to run such a randomized trial during a pandemic. That's just impossible. Fully agreed. Will you be able to collect data during the pandemic or have, did you have to stop? We did, but it's, it, it really dropped. I mean, we, okay. we had to, we had, during this phase, we really had to, uh, you know, enforce the evaluation a lot of times. And we just didn't do that during the pandemic because there was uh, there other things going on in the emergency service. Okay. Good. Thank you very much. So for the sake of time, unfortunately, we have to move on now. And uh, now the next speaker is Dr. Sarah Power. Sarah Power graduated from the National Institute of Ireland in Galway, and she completed her radiology training in Beaumont Hospital in Dublin. And then she did a fellowship and higher specialist training uh, at the University of Toronto Medical Imaging Program in Canada. And then she did a two-year fellowship of inter interventional radiology. And her areas of interest are vessel wall imaging, endovascular therapy, and cerebral aneurysm and me uh, mechanical thrombectomy. And she's going to talk about right patient is standardization with uh, artificial intelligence uh, support, the right uh, approach. And again, there is a poll question before. Uh, the question is how important is advanced imaging, CTP, or MRP? when determining uh, eligibility for thrombectomy. And now I would like to hand over to Sarah. Sarah, can you hear us? I can, yes, sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, good, good afternoon. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, I see the results of the poll uh, just come in, and uh, there's a little bit of variation in how what people think about uh, about going along with criteria um, and the conversations I'm sure that happen in the, are similar to conversations that happen in our own centre, and some of that is is in the presentation, and um, so that's interesting. Um, so if we're going to talk about um, the right patient and is standardization with AI support the right approach for the patient and can it help us to identify the right patient uh, and that's the patient who will potentially uh, benefit from uh, thrombectomy and getting to TK3 of course uh, is, is a factor in, in, in their benefit. Um, there are a few aspects to this, but really, to some extent, we're talking about selection of patients and imaging selection. And um, what we are need is uh, software um, with uh, AI that could help us to identify extent of infarction, the LVO, um, and then also to help us with advanced imaging techniques like CT perfusion. And that software is out there. Um, but also... Um, it can help us, I think, with decision times. It can have a use of AI support can help us uh, and have an impact on imaging to decision time, for example, which will have a consequent impact on other key time metrics uh, for the patient and so it can affect outcome. And also uh, communication, you saw from the last speaker, uh, an, an app that they have, which can help with communication. And uh, some of the AI uh, support apps and imaging, uh, 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 the automated imaging um, uh, software has... Uh, there's um, an interface where, uh, with the web user interface, you can input patient data, and then it can be available not just uh, in the stroke center the patient uh, is admitted to initially, but also along the patient's journey. So, for example, transfer from a primary stroke center to comprehensive stroke center, and also there's the whole issue of uh, potentially being able to get uh, on a web app or on um, a phone app um, alerts to say that there is a, a scan that has been processed and that there is a positive finding on the scan. Um, so 
sorry, just to move on, uh, just to step back a little bit then, back to uh, 2015, and we all know this, that a number of randomised controlled trials firmly established the benefit of thrombectomy uh, for patients in the early time window. Uh, and then if we roll on to 2018, and we can see that um, the Dawn and Diffuse 3 trials, uh, results of those were published, um, and that showed that in a carefully selected group of patients, um, thrombectomy is beneficial out to 24 hours. Um, and those, both of those trials used advanced imaging uh, in order to select uh, a, a specific patient group who would potentially benefit from thrombectomy. And the results for a good outcome in terms of uh, functional dependence on 90 days in Dawn and Diffuse 3 was very similar to that from the Hermes collaboration. And that led to a change in the guidelines, and the, the, these are the ESO guidelines, with the recommendation for treatment that somebody who is, uh, has selection criteria um, similar to Diffuse 3 or Dawn should have a thrombectomy if they are presenting in the late time window. And it also gave recommendations for imaging. So in the late time window, uh, advanced imaging selection is considered to be necessary as per the guidelines. Um, in the early time window, advanced imaging for selection is, is not necessary. So you can look at that in a very simplified, uh, simplified flow model type or flow chart, um, which would show you that uh, for all patients, you need some kind of parenchymal imaging to exclude hemorrhage and see if there's a large established uh, infarct. Um, maybe can help you exclude a mimic. Everyone should have some kind of angiographic imaging, mostly that would be CTA or MRA. Uh, but then once you get to the uh, delayed uh, or the late time window, um, then if patients meet donor diffuse three criteria, the the, uh, the guidance is that advanced imaging selection is necessary. Now, there are going to be some challenges to that. Not every centre has access to advanced imaging. Um, there's a whole discussion about whether it would be CTP or MR-based imaging. For us, in our stroke network, it's, al it's almost exclusively CT that we use for patient selection, and so we're talking about CT perfusion. And that's what I'm going to talk most about here. Um, and I think there's a real definite significant role here for AI software support. I think it's really important that we have some kind of automated analysis of core, um, of territory at risk, penumbra with volume, so we can meet those criteria for Dawn and Diffuse 3 if needed. Um, and that that uh, software should be fast, it should be robust, it should be reproducible, and it should be really easy to interpret. Uh, just to share with you a little about our service and where uh, such software could fit in. Um, so these are our thrombectomy numbers for 2018 and 2019. We are the yellow centre uh, in the east of the country there, Beaumont Hospital. We're a comprehensive stroke centre and the second country uh, comprehensive Stroke Centre is in the south, uh, CUH. That covers approximately the uh, southern uh, third of the Republic of Ireland and we cover the rest. Um, we can see that our centres are quite dispersed and then there's a cluster of centres close to us in Dublin. The majority of our centres um, would not actually have access to advanced imaging. The majority of those uh, primary stroke centres would be using CT and CTA for patient selection. Um, you can also see that in, in, in 2018, 33% uh, of the patients that we treated with thrombectomy were in the late time window. And approximately 85% of the patients we treat are transfers in. So we have run a drip and ship model. And these are some meeting uh, times for the key steps in patients undergoing thrombectomy for, uh, for Ireland in 2019. And this data is uh, uh, from our thrombectomy service and also our national QI project. We're constantly striving in Ireland to try and reduce the key time metrics for all stroke patients in Ireland. We have a very ambitious plan that we'll be able to achieve in 30 minutes, so every stroke patient in Ireland will, will have a, a decision made regarding IVTPA and thrombectomy within 30 minutes of their arrival at the door of ED. Um, for 2019, our median times for imaging to, uh, for door to CT were 22 minutes, uh, for door to needle 50 minutes, um, and for door to thrombectomy uh, uh, centre contact 54 minutes, and door in derived times 101 minutes. You can see uh, at the bottom then our uh, medium, uh, median onset to puncture time was 5 hours 32, and 19 minutes later we had uh, the vessel uh, 
uh, recanalize or reperfusion. So we're pretty fast when we get the patient, but the issue, of course, is getting the patient. And what I want to draw your attention to is uh, is is this is this here that uh, the median time from CT to our comprehensive uh, stroke center contact in 2019 was 32 minutes. So you have to wonder what happens in that 32 minutes, and why does why why is there such a delay? And I think that this really is where uh, software can can help us um, if it can rapidly identify the infarct, rapidly identify the LVO and send an alert to the stroke team to indicate that there's a positive uh, positive finding in the patient and maybe even to the INR person who's on call in the comprehensive stroke centre uh, or covering that day, then I think that, that can really have a positive impact on decision making and so a positive impact on a uh, patient outcome. Um, now, there are a number of different uh, software platforms available, as I'm sure everybody knows. Today, for the purposes of this, I'm going to concentrate on the Brainamix software. Uh, but really, what this can give you is very fast access to images, fast uh, access to uh, post-processed post images. Um, and the results um, can come back in three main formats. They can come back into packs. Uh, there can be an email notification. And this is what I find particularly useful. It can come back into a mobile app. Uh, you saw the utility of such a thing uh, in the last presentation and also into a web user interface. And I would uh, rely heavily on the mobile app, particularly when I'm on call. If I'm at home, I can see imaging. I can, can get an alert to say a new scan has been processed, not just in my center, but in any of our spoke centers that have the, uh, have the software. So I find it really useful. I'm just going to go through each of these uh, individually. So if we look at the uh, e-aspects uh, post-processing, um, you can see that it can automatically uh, identify a, a positive aspect zone and so we'll give an automated aspect score. The, re the uh, reader on the left there is from one of our stroke patients. And what I think is... is uh, unique really to this software and what I do find very valuable is this automatic shading or heat map which shows you the areas of acute hypodensity and then it can give you a volume for that acute hypodensity. So really it's giving you it's giving you a volume of acute infarction in that patient. Uh, and I find this uh, I have to say very uh, reliable and, and uh, so far I've, I have to say I find it qu to be quite accurate. In the middle picture then you can see that it can also detect uh, hemorrhage or uh, as evidenced by hyperdensity, and that's shaded in a different colour, in this case pink, uh, and it's also able to identify uh, a hyperdense uh, MCA sign. So for the centre and the non-expert reader who only has uh, maybe non contrast CT and CTA, this software can be really useful. Um, and one of the questions I would ask is, you know, some patient, as we know, um, not all centres have access to advanced imaging, and in the future, could we use non contrast CT alone to help to determine whether somebody is eligible eligible for thrombectomy, even in the late window, if they have an LVO. Uh, so from 2019, this study was published in JNIS, and it was a retrospective review of Hermes-like patients uh, who'd achieved a really good recanalization, and their aspect score was... Um, was uh, determined using the e-aspect software. And the, two, the patients were divided then into two groups, an early versus a late window group. Um, and you can show that actually the outcome in terms of MRS was the same for both of, of the early and the late groups. So it doesn't matter. Uh, it's equally effective to use uh, um, e-aspects uh, scoring uh, for patients who are in the early window and late window. If we move on then, and this was a more recent publication, which was for the purposes of validation of the automatically derived acute ischemic volumes, which is the volume from the heat map I just showed you. And that showed that the, um, that the uh, automatically derived acute ischemic volume and the e-aspect scores both were able to independently predict good outcome in this study cohort. And then in subsets of patients who had advanced imaging, um, the volume correlated significantly and strongly with DEWI lesion volume and also CTP derived estimates for ischemic core volumes. So I think this is something that you could potentially use to give you a core volume of infarction. And so you could use it, uh, you know, to, um, to see, to, to, to help with your patient selection. And if it gives you a volume, then your, your patient could meet Dawn or diffuse three criteria. If we move on, then looking at the ECTA, and I'm sure uh, people who use software like this are very uh, familiar with uh, uh, such uh, images. The top right is output from one of our patients, but basically it can identify the LVO. There's a heat map that shows you reduced density of contrast on, on, this, on the affected side, um, and it can handle both um, single phase 
and it can also hand, handle uh, multi-phase SCTA with a fairly robust uh, collateral score, uh, which, which uh, is available, as you can see in the uh, output there on the right. And there was a recent study that looked at the uh, ECTA automated measurement of collateral score uh, from the software, and it found that it provides similar measures to consensus expert opinion and improves inter-rater uh, reliability. And I think that that is something that is useful uh, to have such a tool, particularly if you have non-expert readers, and it can help to standardize um, um, scoring of collaterals across uh, networks. Um, and that in particular is useful if you're going to uh, use something like uh, escape criteria to try and um, uh, um, determine who's potentially eligible for thrombectomy out into the late window. Um, uh, of course, pick, there were patients in escape who showed benefit up to 12 hours, and we also have uh, published on this. So uh, we have been treating uh, late window uh, thrombectomy patients for quite some time prior to dawn and diffuse three, and using a CT and a CTA based uh, uh, imaging selection um, criteria. Um, and you can see for uh, patients who were treated at over six hours um, that there was no significant difference in terms of uh, um, outcome between the early and late groups if they had good collaterals. Uh, and then we've also published um, our data for uh, thrombectomy it performed at over 12 hours. And you can see that the functional independence of these patients who have good collaterals um, is 52%, uh, which is uh, similar, of course, to Dawn, Diffuse 3 and Hermes. Um, so I just want to share a case with you. So this is a 71-year-old male who went into one of our peripheral, uh, sorry, our primary stroke centres. And the centre he went into has e-imaging, uh, has e-software available. And he was found with symptoms early in the morning with an unknown lasting well time. So he actually fits into the category of a late window patient because of that. And um, he was quickly in the um, in the primary stroke centre. His NHS score was 18, so a severe stroke. And he had a door to CT time of 12 minutes, which is pretty pretty reasonable. Uh, this is the output then. So it shows um, that he had very little in terms of acute infarction. He had a right M1 occlusion um, identified by the software and a good collateral score uh, of three. So good collaterals. Um, and also his right ICA was occluded on the CTA. So his aspect score was 10, collateral score 3, didn't get thrombolysis because of unknown onset time. Um, and we received a referral um, at 9.50 a.m. Now, I could see the imaging in the app, so decision was made less than one minute later. So his Dorch decision time was 29 minutes and the CTH decision time was 16 minutes. This hospital also has an ambulance wait uh, project, so the same paramedics that picked him up brought him to uh, our comprehensive stroke centre. He was door to door in 67 minutes didn't need to repeat his imaging because he was in really quick. Um, he had a right uh, ICA occlusion, recanalized, or I reopened the ICA first, took clot out with aspiration, aspirated the M1, clot, and uh, stented the ICA. And then, of course, he got to Tiki 3. Um, and he's had a really good outcome. Uh, this is his non contrast CT of 24 hours, and he had a drop in NHS from 18 to 5. So this is a patient who was in the late window, but we were able to uh, we were able to um, identify him as a as a candidate based on just non con CT and CTA. Sarah, just to move two on. minutes. Oh yeah, two thank minutes. you. Yeah. Thanks. So just to move on quickly then to advanced imaging techniques, so CT perfusion. Um, so um, we only added CT perfusion to our acute stroke imaging in 2018, um, and we don't do it in everybody. Um, we have many conversations about this, but basically situations where I would say that it's very um, uh, helpful are particularly um, uh, where there's a large infarct already visible, the borderline aspect scores may be borderline. Uh, if there's subtle changes on the CT, but we're not sure, uh, particularly if it's an M2 occlusion or if our stroke uh, physicians are going to give late window IV thrombolysis. This is another case. This guy was in really early. He was found with symptoms at, at, at 20 past uh, eight, and his, he was in um, the primary stroke center um, just over an hour later. Um, he had a quick door to CT time, but you can see he already had early infarction and he had a bad collateral score. Um, he was transferred up to our centre. There were some delays in his transfer. This centre didn't have the uh, e-software um, post-processing. And I just want to show this because he had a pretty big infarct and it was borderline whether I do him or not. And really, uh, the volume here was 67 mils on the heat map for acute infarction. Went on to do a CT perfusion in him, which I found really helpful. It did, of course, show the infarct.
infarct, but it also showed the potential territory at risk. So he did go on to have a thrombectomy, achieved six, uh, TIKI 3, and actually he's had a really good outcome. The 20, CT of 24 hours showed exactly the same extent of infarction, and then his NIH score dropped from 16 to 7, and then down to 4 at day 5, and he's done really well. So is AI support the right approach for the patient and patient selection? I think it is. Does everyone need to have advanced imaging? I think that's not necessarily the case. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for speeding up uh, for, and thank you very much for your great presentation. I think it's a really important topic, you know, advanced imaging. So um, please, all the colleagues uh, who are also speakers, um, you have the possibility to turn on your camera and to ask questions. So um, uh, let me start with the first question. Uh, in your daily clinical practice, is now CTP uh, in your hospital, is it clinical routine or not? So, well, I can answer for, I've, I've touched on it in the presentation, I suppose. It's routine in that everyone who comes to RED has an order for CTP as part of their fast imaging, but we can step in at any time and say, we don't need it in this patient. We're happy to make a decision on what we have. Let's not take the time to do it. But equally, I find it really useful in certain situations, like, for example, the case I showed. Great. Johannes, you have a question? Yeah, so, um, Sarah, uh, thanks a lot for this great yeah. talk. Um, I always get the feeling that the stroke community is a little bit obsessed with patient selection, maybe mainly due to the fact that uh, they really wanted two thrombectomy trials to be a positive trials. And um, I have a little bit difficulties understanding the selection process uh, right now because it basically shifted, right? You are really f trying mm -hmm. to find patients uh, which or who actually do not benefit from mechanical thrombectomy. And it's actually not easy to find these patients. And um, for example, we tried even using sophisticated algorithm to find patients uh, or to predict an MRS 5 or 6 after mechanical thrombectomy, uh, having a certain probability cutoff like being able to do that with a higher percent of um, uh, positive predict value with like 80 or 90 percent and it, it's really difficult to do that and uh, I think you could also argue as long as you are not able to do that you can argue just basically do it mainly in everyone as long as there are no resource problems which they probably aren't uh, so yeah there's a lot of work ongoing with this advanced imaging but but sometimes i think you can also flip it the other way around and i'm sometimes missing the arguments why not to do it like this yeah i think it's a it's rather a comment than a question and i i i think it's a very good point and i think we really should start to to look the other things uh the, the, the things the other way around because we know that endovascular therapy is highly effective we know that we're not doing any major harm and we have very high chances to, uh, to, to, to be beneficial for our patients. So why not just simply do it? Yeah, Martin, I mean, do you I'm also have a question? That... Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, you know, okay, go ahead, sorry, Johanna, sorry for interrupting you. No, no, I, I don't want to say that there's no room for this advanced imaging, but I, I think at, at the time, but I mean, this is, has been going on for five years now after the trial. So I think by the time now, there should be some data that, which actually shows, okay, we are really, really good at excluding patients who really do not benefit but uh, but i haven't seen actually a paper who can who can really pin it down with a high percent of certainty that's just what, what i have the feeling about this martin yeah, what's your uh, opinion on there are uh, sarah first and martin second um, yeah, I agree. I think the I think the problem is in some in some in some countries you will have resource issues. That's part of maybe the pro, maybe the the issue. But yet, um, I mean, we would really try to be um, we would try to give patients the benefit of the doubt. You know, that's that's how we see it. Um, um, but um, but I think that it is reasonable to accept that in somebody, for example, with an aspect score of zero, that it's really unlikely that they're going to have a good benefit. And then the question is, where is the cutoff? As you say, you know, there are there are probably a group of patients that won't benefit, and um, imaging could maybe help with those. But we really try to to give patients the benefit of the doubt and and do it if we think that there could be any chance they benefit at all. Martin. Well, it, it's rather also a comment on, on the discussion. And um, I just want to remind every one of us, there's a lot more than selecting patients, because I totally agree with Johannes that 
deselecting patients, um, that's not really the point now. But for us as neurologists and also neurointensivists, um, it's, it's useful information. And I think, um, especially in the late time window uh, patients, I, I really um, value the information of the perfusion images in the acute phase, not only, not, not for selecting, um, but, but for further information of infarct pattern, of the probability of, of being, you know, uh, well or not well on the next day. So there's a lot more information in there and we should not disregard that, but I totally agree that deselect, using that to deselect patients in huge centers or larger centers, that's really not the point at that time. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, also for, for, for the uh, discussion in the inputs. So I think uh, we now should move on uh, to the next speaker. So it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, your, uh, Johannes Kersmacher, who has already asked a question here. Johannes Kersmacher, he trained at the Technical University in Munich. And he now works at the Institute of Diagnostic and Interventional Neuroradiology at the University Hospital here in Bonn. So he's a research group leader of the um, acute stroke intervention uh, team of the Stroke Research Center here in Bonn. And his main focus of his research is on the use of thrombolysis in acute stroke uh, treatment. And uh, so the title of his talk uh, will be um, uh, right a uh, treatment at the techno study and uh, i'm very happy that you're giving this presentation even though it's your birthday today so congratulations and uh, the poll question today is uh, do you administer intrathecal thrombolysis uh, during or after mt on a case to case basis so that's an important question are you doing it when the patient for instance the angiosy you have an incomplete perfusion are you giving TPA or even other drugs, lytics, or not? So please answer the poll, send it, and then we will see the results. 100%. Okay, so I uh, now give you uh, um, uh, the lead. Uh, um, Johannes, please uh, proceed. Thank you, Ross, for this uh, kind introduction. And <clears throat> Welcome everybody also from my side. So um, obviously the right treatment is not a study. So I will guide you through the uh, evidentiary background uh, of the trial, which focus on the value of intraarterial uh, thrombolytics in acute ischemic stroke and specifically after mechanical thrombectomy. So after publication of the pivotal mechanical thrombectomy trials and also um, the additional trials in the extended time window, you all know that um, there are several questions remaining. So the new frontiers in endovascular stroke treatment, and they obviously range from reperfusion techniques and the pre and peri and post procedural management, patient indication and patient population groups, uh, most prominently patients with a large infarct core or a distal or medium vessel occlusion, and then the value of thrombolysis, including intravenous or intraarterially administered ones. And most recently, also neuroprotection uh, in or after mechanical thrombectomy with the uh, promising results um, published uh, in the ESCAPE NI1 trial. So, this talk will focus on a combination of these two front lines. So, uh, the reperfusion, so getting to TIKI3, but also thrombolysis. And uh, this is a case of a TIKI2B rescue. So, you have patients with incomplete reperfusions and how to deal with them further. You will all know cases like these. So there's a 60-year-old patient four hours after symptom onset, NHS is 16, aspect 7, left-sided M1 and moderate collaterals. So you administer IVT and uh, there's an incomplete reperfusion, tiki to b after the third pass, and you see that there is a capillary phase deficit projecting onto the frontal MCA territory. And the question is obviously what to do now. I'm not sure if there are as many options as there are doors depicted in this image, but still you have to think what you will do with this patient. And I do not want to bore you with uh, the overall discussion, of course, that TIKI3 is better than TIKI2B, and TIKI3 should be the goal, you all know that. But let's take a closer look at what we are talking about here. So the question is, what can we expect if we improve a TIKI2B reperfusion 
to Tiki 3. And um, for that, I think the most important question is out of those Tiki 3, which ones are actually primary ones? So going straight from Tiki 0 to Tiki 3, uh, which is obviously related to um, only a few maneuvers needed for that. And we don't know what is the percentage actually of those who had a secondary improvement from 2B to 3. But it seems very likely that those secondary improvements of going from Tiki to B to 2C or Tiki to B to 3, they will be somewhere in between. Uh, because on average for that, you will have later reperfusion, uh, you will need more passes. And so the outcome is expected to be lower. Um, in general, and this is what you see here, the reason why the outcome is lower um, is straightforward. You see an in, uh, intracranial ICA occlusion, which was treated with mechanical thrombectomy, and you see them some periodontal capillary phase deficit, a 2B after the uh, intervention. And you see nicely that this deficit persists after 24 hours, leading to infarction in this area. And this is also why, of course, the ESO and ESMA guidelines, as was already said, they recommend that the goal should be a Tiki 3 reperfusion if achievable with reasonable safety, whatever that means uh, in the more concrete case. Uh, notably, although the numbers of Tiki 3s are improving, it's still, I think, a significant problem because in Escape NA1, uh, the frequency of Tiki 2B reperfusions was 40%. So, when you encounter such a case, of course, there are many options. You can go for more distal mechanical maneuvers, including adjustable sand retrievers or even uh, microcatheter aspiration techniques. Uh, you could administer intraarterial thrombolysis, and uh, I think uh, two out of three uh, uh, selected this uh, answer here in this poll. And of course, there's the options of giving IV lysis, but this will depend most certainly on the results of the other direct mechanical thrombectomy trials. So currently, this is not an option. And uh, regarding the mechanical maneuvers in general, uh, Mario will guide you uh, through this uh, in general. And so I will focus on the AI lysis. Here you can see um, a, a nice survey done by Kastan Guia and colleagues where they asked interventionalists, but also neurologists, uh, what to do with these kinds of uh, periprocedural emboli. And in this case, uh, here the colossal module and uh, pericolosal emboli, they asked them what to do, and 25 uh, argued for uh, giving intraarterial thrombolysis, and 50% would go for additional maneuvers. However, uh, this changes significantly if they put in a case here with uh, multiple distal emboli after mechanical thrombectomy for an M1 occlusion with uh, some M3 branch occlusions here. Here, 50% would actually favor no further treatment, and 40% uh, would favor giving intraarterial thrombolytics, and just a minority would go for additional mechanical maneuvers. So uh, from a theoretical perspective, there are, of course, reasons to go for, which make it more likely to go for mechanical maneuvers and uh, others which make it more likely to go for intraarterial thrombolysis. Obviously, in general, the benefit of any kind of these rescues will decrease the smaller the residual uh, vessel is because on average, the tissue which can be saved is smaller. However, for the mechanical uh, options, I think this drop in the potential benefit over risk uh, has a more steep decline because uh, the, the smaller the vessel is, of course, uh, um, the more likely you are to cause uh, periprocedural uh, complications. And on the other hand, I think the recognition rate is likely uh, to drop in, in very small uh, uh, caliber vessels. On, and then this is a little bit contrasted by the intraarterial thrombolysis, where I think in general the recognition rate will be lower, but it, it, it is expected to increase with smaller caliber vessels. And I think the complication rate increase, depending a little bit on how, where you want to uh, localize your microcatheter, I think it's, it will not be as, uh, let's say, with smaller caliber vessels, um, the increase in complication rate will not be as high as for mechanical maneuvers. So in general, the potential benefit over risk, the, the decrease of that curve will be a little bit uh, more flat. And 
What I will talk about is mainly in this area here, marked in red. So the rather small ones, so the persisting deficits, uh, um, including those small arteries. So you all know that intraarterial fibrinolytics after mechanical thrombectomy is really not a new treatment. And uh, you all know the PROAC2 study uh, published in 1999, showing a huge benefit uh, compared to IV heparin here. Uh, with a considerable treatment effect and recanalization. And looking back and moving forward to the current situation of endovascular stroke treatment, you could basically argue why not give it after mechanical thrombectomy. Uh, we had a brief look actually at uh, data from the uh, Bernice Center where we found around 100 patients who received additional intraarterial urokinase, which was administered during or after mechanical thrombectomy. And we found that um, indeed, uh, the thrombolysis was able to shift the TIKI score after the intervention uh, favorably. And we also found that the functional outcome was better in those uh, receiving intraarterial urokinase in fully adjusted model, which is highlighted here with model B. And we did not find evidence for increased risk of bleeding, which obviously is the major concern for administering intraarterial uh, thrombolysis. So we had a look what the what the other people do, and uh, we found several papers, and we also uh, contacted the uh, Hermes collaborators uh, regarding this data and also um, other centers. And notably, in the German Stroke Registry, 40% of interventionalists answered that yes, they use intraarterial RTPA in individual case decision. Um, regarding the observational data, which is available, we could not find any evidence for an increased risk of bleeding uh, using this intraarterial thrombolytics approach after mechanical thrombectomy. But you have to keep in mind that these were, of course, selected patients and low dosages only. So in the next step, we asked other centers to provide their data on the, uh, on the uh, standard how they approach this problem. And we found other centers administering intraarterial fibrinolytics after MT, and here, the rate of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage was comparable um, and a uh, considerable amount of patients um, showed reperfusion improvement after the administration of intraarterial feminolytics, which was administered in these cases after the mechanical intervention has stopped. And there was a ticky grade relevant improvement in 30% of those patients. You can see here that the ticky shift uh, was also found in this uh, registry analysis. And as I said, 50% had an angiographic improvement. And this was this translated into a clinical benefit, which is uh, nicely shown here in this MRS bars. So you may, we can conclude that intraarterial fibrinolytics seem to me as a viable treatment option for selected cases where the reperfusion is incomplete. And you can be very sure that when you are able to improve your perfusion, that such a technique is uh, likely to be cost effective. Because we know from the Hermes data that with increasing reperfusion grade, there's a net uh, monetary benefit, uh, which will likely cover the costs of such a treatment. So you can argue, OK, it might be ready to, to prime time to, to use such an approach. And when you want to randomize now patients um, to, to getting intraarterial fibrinolytics after mechanical thrombectomy or standard of care, I think there are many questions. So you have to decide what drug, in which time frame, uh, do you allow it after IVTPA? Do you want to compare it to any kind of mechanical uh, maneuvers? What endpoint do you want to use? So we thought. A, a lot actually about that and finally we came up now with the, our decision regarding this so the drug we want to use is intraarterial uh, tenecteplase up to six hours um, mainly uh, this was derived from the early intraarterial thrombolytics trials and it's possible uh, in this trial to give it after ivtpa uh, there will be no mechanical comparator and it will be a surrogate endpoint trial which will i explain in a minute there will be two outcomes, uh, early reperfusion, which is straightforward, just an angiographic assessment 20 minutes after randomization, which is approximately 15 minutes after intraarterial tenecteplase. And there will be also late reperfusion because we actually don't know when this treatment and reperfusion will occur. Um, 
And this would be evaluated using 24-hour MRI perfusion. Here are some nice examples that even small and geographically discernible deficits uh, are covered by MRI perfusion or follow-up images. Here you can nicely see this small parietal branch occlusion, which uh, was there on 24-hour MRP. And the other case, which I showed you already, this uh, parietal perfusion deficit here, nicely corresponding to this deficit after 24 hours. So ba basically why we opted against using a clinical endpoint, there are so many factors in this decision um, or uh, factors related to if a patient really benefits uh, in a clinical way from this is, you have to be sure that this is, uh, tissue is not yet infarcted and we don't know the actual magnitude of the effect of patients um, improving from tiki 2 b to tiki 3 and we calculated sample sizes and the basic number we come up with is somewhere around 1,000 patients. So it's not a straightforward trial um, for clinical endpoints, I think. So um, coming close to the end already, I will briefly uh, uh, like to introduce it to you to the TECHNO trial, which is the safety and efficacy of intraarterial tenecteplase for non-complete reperfusions of intraarterial occlusions trial, which is um, a trial including 156 patients randomized in a one-to-one -one ratio. As I said, we will administer three milligrams of tenecteplase in 20 centers. Uh, IVTPA is allowed up to six hours is allowed. The only thing is that we will exclude tandem uh, occlusions for obvious reasons regarding co-medication. Um, the patient population we want to look at are anterior circulation strokes, so M1 and ICA, tiki 2 b for M2 also tiki 2 a because even a tiki 2 a can be small uh, caliber vessel in M2 occlusions. And in general, the definition is that the operator should state that he would not go for any additional mechanical maneuvers uh, in this scenario, and this is then the point of randomization. It's a straightforward uh, pragmatic trial uh, with the uh, best medical treatment arm and the intervention arm. Uh, and this will be followed up, as I said, by the catheter and geography, the MRP, uh, which constitute the two uh, clinical, uh, the two surrogate endpoints, and then the clinical visits in standard stroke trials, so up to 90 days. Um, there's also one uh, comparable trial, the CHOICE trial, which randomizes patients to uh, intraarterial TPA and placebo. There are some differences regarding this trial, uh, mainly related to the placebo injection, which we opted against. Uh, then also for the choice of the drug, of course, and the endpoints. So we really focus on a proof of concept and the surrogate endpoint trial. Uh, well, this study uh, is designed a little bit different, but we are really keen um, looking at the results of this trial. So to sum it up, I think uh, there are currently a lot of open questions uh, for how you want to approach a tiki to b reperfusion once it occurs. And this is essentially true also for the, the smaller ones. I think the current observational data, there is there are some promising uh, results uh, pointing towards that there is a potential role of intraarterial fibrinolytics, but there's severe bias, of course, due to selection. So we don't know. And in general, I think the, the decision making, if you want to stop or treat the patient further, is a difficult one. And there are many factors related to that. And we try to sum it up in this uh, nice review if you're inter uh, interested in a little bit more details uh, regarding this. And uh, I'm really hopeful that we can uh, make a difference fo focusing on that patient population group because we have to remember these are 40% of the patients uh, treated endovascularly. And with that, I'd like to, to close and I'd like to thank the organizers for this kind invitation and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Johannes, for this great talk on the techno trial and uh, the role of lytics uh, in patients with acute uh, large vessel occlusion. Uh, just before we start with the question, uh, it, this is uh, housekeeping information. Um, so if you have problems to enter your question in the Q&A, then please refresh your browser. You will be kicked out for, for a minute or two. But then afterwards, you should be able to enter your question uh, in, uh, the, in the system. So try it if you have any further question. So uh, I would now allow, like to hand over to Martin. Do you have any questions for Johannes? Uh, yes, Johannes, a great talk. And I think uh, you have to con 
be completely related to this to the trial because I think it's a very useful trial. As you say, it's a pressing clinical question, and um, there's room for improvement. Just uh, two or uh, two uh, short questions. What about T and K? Is that easy to do in in Switzerland? I mean, it's it's not approved for the treatment of stroke. So in Germany, this would be a very complicated trial to do. Yeah, exactly. It's a really complicated trial to do. Uh, I mean, it's basically, yeah, there is no, I mean, it's uh, the, the only indication in Switzerland is for myocardial infarction with the standard criteria. If you're not able to have the PCI within, I don't know, I forgot it, like 120 minutes or something like that. And so, yeah, basically, it's uh, you have to submit this to the medical agencies in whatever country you want to do the trial. That's uh, okay. a problem, uh, which is basically related to a lot of work, yeah. And the, and the second question I would have, and I mean, TNK is probably not the perfect drug for doing that, but have you thought about titrating to un, un, until uh, reperfusion? Because that's yeah. what we I mean, do in clinical practice. I mean, we, we use small amounts of TPA right in front of the clot if we can get there, and then titrate with doing several, you know, uh, se several steps and then stopping by reperfusion, but going on until the maximum of 10 milligrams. Yeah, we, I mean, that's, that's also a question which is related to the dose, right? So, so how do you come up with the initial dose, the maximum dose? I mean, what we did now is, so uh, we basically, so okay, what's, what's the median value uh, people use in the current observation of that, which is around like 10, 11, uh, milligram of TPA and basically uh, we translate it into TNK just using the standard IV dose from the um, from the extent IA TNK1 trial and the titration issue I think is a is an important one I mean we the initial thought that why we wanted to go for it to neck the place it's it, it if it works it could be such an easy procedure right you just go there with a microcatheter you inject it as a bolus and you leave because the whole procedure which is associated with this uh um let's say titrating until reperfusion that's a like the lengthy procedure which might actually have a better efficacy but then you really run into problems so when do you assess reperfusion in the control arm right because you, you, at some points, you have to do imaging in a standardized way. And you, you, you can, of course, do that after six hours with MR perfusion or some fancy stuff. But, but in which hospitals you can actually do that? So we, that it's, a, it's a mixture right now between the ideal one, when you want to uh, um, assess reperfusion and what is feasible. So the titrating problem is that the, that the reperfusion time point then is very mixed. Right. For some, it might be after 30 minutes. For some, it might be after two two hours. Uh, and in the control arm, it will be a fixed a fixed time window. Uh, so there are, I think, for the trial feasibility, the assessment of the reperfusion, but then also of the let's say ease of the procedure you want to evaluate. Uh, we opted against that, but of course, you run into the possibility that actually the treatment would work, but you just did it wrong because you just give it, uh, gave it as a bolus. This, this is basically the, the considerations where we ended up with, with that, yeah. So thank you very much. So unfortunately, for the sake of time, we have to stop this very uh, uh, interesting discussion now. And uh, uh, thanks again and happy birthday again. And now we're moving to the next speaker. It's uh, Dr. Mario Martinez Caldames uh, from Spain. Uh, he's the head of the neuroradiology unit at the University Clinical Hospital of Valladolid. And he's a researcher and clinician, and he has published a lot of papers. He has been involved in many randomized controlled trials. And he's also uh, involved in the um, uh, evaluation program uh, in, uh, in Spain. So uh, thank you very much for accepting this invitation. And the title of the talk will be now a more technical one. So it is the right technique for each patient. So the floor is yours. And before we start with your presentation, um, it is, uh, we still have again a question, in which situation you modify your standard thrombectomy approach, uh, and here are the different questions, uh, expected ideology of the clot, access challenge on CTA, 
specific lot locations have different approaches. I stay with my standard approach and only uh, switch if failure or other. So please vote now and then we can see uh, the, um, the vote. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And uh, well, thank you again, uh, Striker, for organizing the webinar. Uh, I have a couple of questions for the previous talk because I love the topic, but it's the same. We will discuss after all if we have time. Uh, but uh, at the end, I think it's important to, well, let's check it. 50% of results were well, not bad. <laughs> okay, so um, this talk is purely technical um, talk, and specifically because at the end we know that beyond the data, beyond the clinical trials, at the end each patient is different. And in the practical day, we face uh, some specific anatomical variation that may change our first approach and we need to change to another. So sometimes it's a decision technique uh, that may be different in, in every hospital. So at the end, we may discuss which one is better, if it's the aspiration itself, is this adapt itself, is better to combine the aspiration through the balloon guide catheter, is better a long stent trigger, which one is better, a long sheet maybe with a distal aspiration catheter plus a stent trigger, or you know, using everything at the same time. So, you know, these are very variable uh, tools, and in each hospital, at least in Spain, use a different technique. At the end, we need to analyze which one is the not better, but at the end, they, they, there is no one better. This do may have any place for any one of these techniques depending on the patient. So uh, we have seen this the first talks. There is no doubt that we need to achieve a first pass effect. This is the most important point if we want to be sure that the patient may benefit and may have a, a, a nice outcome. So there is no uh, doubt that we need to achieve the uh, uh, complete uh, first pass effect as fast as possible. And for if we can do it during the first pass, it's much better. So there are two specific locations to analyze, and we need to discuss after all if you want which is the ICR terminal, so the supraclinoid the tica occlusions, and also the, uh, the use of the balloon guide catheter. So in this uh, analysis of the trial, we see that the uh, distal ICA occlusions have less recanalization rate than comparing with other locations like M1, M2, vitreovascular, et cetera. And it seems that using the balloon guide catheter you may achieve also more recanalization rate by using a long shift, or you ha may have a small distal emboli. So this is a practical case. We all have this type of cases. So at the end, we need to decide in this type of cases with a complete occlusion of the supraclinal segment in which one is better. Is it better to directly aspirate here, do a thrombectomy with a regular stent uh, using two stent trivers, aspirate proximally. So there are a, little, a lot of difference that may change a difference in the terms of outcomes. So personally, in those cases where you have a superclinal ICA, like in this case, and you may achieve a distal uh, uh, catheterization, the ones that I prefer personally is to inflate here uh, the proximal ICA and uh, balloon gate catheter and do a tough aspiration. And from doing that, you may achieve a lot of clots just before doing the thrombectomy. Like for example, in this case, as you may see, it's a, a lot of clots in ICA uh, in cervical ICA, which at the end, just for only doing a proximal aspiration with balloon guide catheter with a 60 cc syringe, you may achieve a mostly complete recanalization without navigation through. So at the end, the use of balloon guide catheter is extremely useful when you are trying to recanalize proximal segments. For example, as you can see here, we fully recanalize from the proximal aspiration. There is a, a distal M2 occlusion, and at this point, you may start doing a regular stent retriever uh, like uh, other techniques. So the power of balloon uh, catheter is, is, is amazing. I don't know if you are able to see uh, the video here. Uh, okay, let me check. Okay, I don't know if you are able to see the video, but this video is just to show uh, how the just for doing the aspiration, all the contrast is going to be back. So the power of aspiration, even distal M1, is uh, is uh, is super, even doing for approximately. So what is the problem? The problem is that we don't know which type of clot we are going to recanalize. You know, there are different studies analyzing uh, the CTA. Uh, try to analyze the density of one clot or the other, but at the end we are all talking about fibrin-rich 
clots, no fibrin bridge clots, but we don't know that the end with type of clot is because we <laughs> we cannot uh, recanalize after after that. So uh, there are different studies to trying to measure that to the density or the or the length of the clot in order to differentiate with uh, SN fever or technique is superior to the other. So what is the point? The point is different patient, different strategies. So I designed this chart for you. Because I hope this can be useful for the people that are starting or are on training because it's an easy way to decide which technique is better. So when we decide which technique is superior to other in order to assess a ticket fee as fast as possible, we also we always consider the proximal axis anatomy. We also study the common carotid morphology for the cervical angulation the clot location, and more or less the clot characteristics. So if you see the third or fourth points is because you need to study carefully the CTA before doing uh, the mechanical thrombectomy. We all focus directly into the CTP, CT, and the baseline CT, but we don't. Uh, sometimes we don't uh, invest time in doing a proper reconstruction of the CTA in order to study the angles of the artery to select which uh, uh, technique is the most appropriate. So, for example, for femoral, uh, when femoral is patent, type 1 or 2 arc, the typical ones we always use uh, through the femoral approach. If it's right side, we prefer uh, the balloon guide catheter. If it's left side, sometimes we select long sheet, but uh, we will show cases after all. When we have type 3 arch, left bovine arc with a close angle, vascular cases of femoral occlusion, we go directly to the radial approach. And when we go through the radial approach, from the right side, we select uh, long sheath for catheterizations, and for the left side, balloon guide catheters. And the reason for doing that is because we, we, we analyze this type of catheterization, and we have seen that we have more kinks, catheter kinks, in the right side by comparing with the left. So at the end, I think this is the best recommendation, is try to avoid balloon guide catheter with doing the right side mechanical thrombectomies. And of course, we will have common carotid occlusion, we select the, the carotid uh, uh, puncture. So this is what I mentioned to you, this is very important to uh, try to analyze, not, you know, not purely the number of the angles or be exactly, but at least the morphology. So this typical proximal, proximal kinking is very limiting. It's very limiting because you know, uh, the, the, the current uh, technology that we have don't have enough support to allow uh, a proximal support in those cloth angles, specifically uh, uh, type two and type three. Uh, angles. So, for example, this is a typical CTA that we reconstruct. You may see that despite this small bovine arc, you have also this proximal uh, angulation that can be a nightmare. So, in those cases, we try to go directly through the radial. You can see the picture. This is a right radial approach. It's an eight friend short sheet because uh, we, we regularly measure the radial uh, artery by doing an ultrasound before, and in cases measuring more than 2.5 millimeters, we place this type of uh, short sheath. And you can may navigate, in this case, the flow gate balloon directly, as you may see here, to, through the left uh, common carotid artery. And uh, because of the kink, even that it was a radial approach, we couldn't uh, navigate it more distally. So in those situations, in this radial approach, what you can do is inflate the balloon, and by inflating the balloon, made you enough support to navigate it distally, the uh, balloon guide, uh, the distal patient catheter and the micro catheter. Let me show you the video uh, explaining that. Um, okay. So in this video, you see that the balloon guide catheter is navigated to the radial approach, but despite there is not enough support proximally, the main recommendation is to inflate it. Inflate the balloon from the beginning, and if you inflate the balloon from the, giving, the beginning, even being in common carotid, made you enough support, as you can see here, to navigate it distally, very distally, even to M1, the uh, distal depression catheter. And this is a, the next video is the same case, as you may see here, by inflating the balloon, you may just push in the micro catheter and the distal depression catheter, you may have enough support for uh, you know achieving the M1 or M2 catheterization. So this recommendation, when you have a proximal, uh, the proximal balloon located into the common carotid, inflated the balloon from the beginning for giving you support and stability. Once you finish the uh, intervention, in this case, the radial is very comfortable and easy to uh, occlude the occlude the, the uh, puncture with this type of system. So at the end, uh, we analyzed the data of the last year 
and we perform an 8% of our cases that radial approach by doing a, a, a pre-operative CTA analysis. And in our analysis, we didn't have, uh, you know, the, the occlusion, the, the reperfusion time was uh, around 20, 30 minutes. So this, for this type of complications, you know, or this type of arc that we, you may invest 30, 40 minutes for doing that uh, uh, through the typical femoral approach, radial may be an alternative. And this is the one that I mentioned to you. When you have a right radial catheterization, if you, if you are uh, going to use the balloon guide catheter, you may have around 20% of catheter kinks that at the end may be very limited. So again, just to remember, right side uh, uh, for the radial is better to use the long sheet. And this is a typical case from the radial with the regular uh, uh, ADA, which can be a, a neuromass or balas or another infinity plus. Uh, you may navigate it from the radial to the right side, and once there, you may use the, the technique that you consider. In this case, for, for supracranial ICA, uh, you will use a lot the double S and trigger. We use two S and triggers in parallel or crossing in order to recanalize. Uh, and we have seen that we have much more ticket three first pass effect in the supracranial ICA using two S and triggers compared with one. So uh, this is another situation possible. As you may see here by study, studying the CTA, it's a proximal occlusion of the common carotid of the left side. So this case is the, is, the, is the only indication that we consider for a direct carotid approach. So you may see here in the second picture, the sheath and the, and the wire. And once we place the short sheath in the distal ICA, you may use the regular technique as you might be more comfortable. In this case, for example, we use a solombra technique with a, a, a long distal placement catheter plus an S10 trigger. Okay, so uh, the common carotid morphology is basic to understand also. Again, you need to be sure that you have a proximal kink of each straight. Uh, uh, the problem with the balloon guide catcher is, is that we mentioned before is that uh, the balloon doesn't have enough support, you know, to be again this type of proximal kinks. So at the end, be sure that you select the, 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 the best uh, uh, guide wire or the best uh, guide catheter, sorry. So cervical angulation in a more distal uh, fashion is very important too because if you identify this type of uh, loops, coils, or whatever, it's better to use a distal placement catheter. If you compare the recognition rate by placing the guide catheter proximal to the kinks or the loops or the coils, but distal, you may see that in those type of situations, you, you may lose a lot of clots during the retrieval. So at the end, it's better to be more distal to the kin or loops or the coils, and you may achieve uh, around the 80 or 90% of recognition by doing this. So we, again, recommend to uh, before doing the thrombectomy, be sure that it's not type of this skin like in this one. And in this uh, particular one, we navigated more distally the long sheath over the skin, and then we uh, navigated distal aspiration catheter for doing the mechanical thrombectomy. So we, we need to avoid this type of, uh, you know, uh, retrievals during this type of angulations. Another Mario, point to please, consider... Please keep in Sorry? mind, we have, three, have three, we have three minutes to go. Okay, so for a clot location, again, for distal uh, terminus, we use a double S and trigger, as mentioned before. We try to combine uh, different type of techniques. For a vascular uh, occlusion, we normally use uh, only aspiration to avoid lenticular straight uh, uh, events. And for distal uh, clots, like in this one, we normally use low profile stent triggers in order to be sure that we pinch the, the system and we retrieve everything back. And we, uh, at the end, we have a nice result. Regarding the clots, uh, as mentioned before, uh, we need to keep in mind that the fibrin-rich clots require a long stent triggers, and long, I mean more than 30 or 40 millimeters, and we need to be sure that we are using these ones. And while well, if you are doing this type of super big clots, what you may use as an uh, a scaffold for doing an aspiration with this type of distal aspiration catheters, like uh, in this case, I don't know, I have the video here. And this is a nice example for a clot, completely clot digestion by using the long centrifuge for a scaffold. So at the end, uh, by using this type of solombra technique, we achieve much more ticky three first pass uh, that uh, using the regular techniques that may be used with the regular centrifuges. Okay, so I think we are finishing. This is another example of high fibrin juice clots. In this case, a calcified clot. Again, we, we select Solombra as the first option for this type of, of calcified clot, and we avoid to use uh, just a an, an regular estrogen trigger uh, effect. So at the end, this is the, the recommendation that, that I'm going to show you, is this type of charge 
I think that's very useful. You need to uh, design a good strategic plan before uh, going into the into the uh, into the case. We need to analyze all these factors that I mentioned to you, and by using this simple chart that may be simple, but it is really useful. You may be sure that you are going to select the most appropriate uh, material. So this is the conclusion at the end. The conclusion could be that we need to be sure that we are using all the combinational techniques available. We have a lot of tools right now. And if with a proper analyze and the proper CT analysis, we be sure that we, in each patient, we may select the most tailored treatment and be sure that we are going the most effective treatment. So this is all, thank you very much. And we are open to start the discussion as you, as you want to consider. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, I think it's a really interesting uh, topic and a very, very nice talk. Uh, let me start with the first question. Uh, you know, the more and more uh, we start to treat this kind of distal vessel occlusion, so what is your general approach with this distal vessel occlusion? How far are you going by? <laughs> so for this <laughs> vessel, I, I think the, the most uh, critical point is to decide if you uh, intubate the patient or not. Because at the end, if you are doing an M1 uh, thrombectomy and you have an M2 or M3 occlusion, that you may, for sure, you may technically go there. But the critical point is if going uh, over sedation or uh, intubate the patient. I don't know what's your experience. If we see the patient and that is quiet, you know, we try to go without... Uh, general anesthesia, but at the end, it's much more safer to go uh, under general anesthesia. Technically, uh, we have done a lot of M3, uh, A3, uh, okay, um, mechanical thrombectomies. Uh, we have more uh, chemorrhage, for sure. Uh, it's, it's, uh, unfortunately, are less symptomatic, but I think that is not if technically feasible or not is, is the indication, for sure. And that's, I think, is the most critical point. So, for instance, have you already done an M3 or M4 in your experience? Yes. What was the, yes, the yes. most peripheral? What was the most peripheral vessel you have reached with your catheter? The most peripheral, I think, it was a M3 for sure, and uh, we could see P4 and a A3. So, well, this is uh, I, I don't. It's not impressive. But uh, I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's not a technical problem. We have a lot of tools, you know, so uh, we'll see if it's necessary or not to treat this type of patients. Great. Martin, do you have a question? No, I think that's, uh, I mean, the technical part is really impressive now. It's, it's about the indication, I would say. As Mario mentions, I mean, the, 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 whole, the whole, you have to look at the whole patient. And um, sometimes I wonder, and I'm not sure what the other experience is, sometimes I wonder that in a subgroup of patients, intubating the patient for a distal occlusion is probably not a good idea. And, and that's mainly because of the, whole, the overall situation of the patient and probably age, probably patient will sometimes. Um, uh, so so, so, so that's, that's my feel on the, on the distal, which is, um, a different story if the patient is secondarily transferred. And um, I think that's, that's another major factor, factor if you know that the patient has completed the TPA for more than an hour, still is occluded, still is aphasic, I would uh, rather do a distal emboli now than I did uh, several years ago. It's not a question, there is a question. Yeah. There, there is a question in the chat uh, for you, uh, Mario. The, the question is regarding aspiration catheters in distal thrombectomy. What is your experience? Yes, for, for distal aspiration, uh, as you know, we have uh, mainly the 3 max. And uh, uh, in our experience, 3 max navigation is, is, is worse than the uh, uh, regular microcatheter. So for distal, for example, if we are talking just purely technical, uh, if you want to use a low-profile uh, stent retriever, you may use, for example, a headway duo. A headway duo, as you know, is super slow-profile uh, marker catheter. So this type of navigation is, is very close or very uh, similar to the marathon. So I think that the regular or the current technology that we have for aspiration is much worse than the uh, stent retriever in terms of navigation. So this was four years ago. I fully agree. We, we select the uh, aspiration, specifically for A1, A2, A3 
systems that are more easy to navigate it, more straight. But for cases, for example, for a, you know, a subdivision M2 or M3, you have a lot of tortuosity. So you need to be sure that you have uh, the, the right mark catheter to navigate it. And again, in this type of angulations, one recommendation I didn't mention, but one of the recommendation is just to use a triaxial system using a three max proximally, then the microcatheter, then the centriver. And by doing that, you may reduce the traction system and the tension over the over the arteries. You may reduce the number of raptors. Excellent. Thank you so much uh, for for uh, for this uh, very very interesting also answer to this important question. So we are coming to the end of this uh, webinar. First of all, I would like to thank all four speakers for these excellent talks. I think uh, we really have learned a lot about the question how we can uh, improve reperfusion uh, in the whole chain of survival uh, in patients with an acute ischemic stroke. Um, I would also like to thank the company for organizing the webinar. It is very uh, important also for, for us uh, that we have the option to share our thoughts and opinions with the audience. And one short comment to Elena and Mario. We will meet on Friday in St. Petersburg. So I will now hand over to Elena. <laughs> No, thank you. Thank you very much for your patience and uh, staying to the end. It has been a great presentation, very interesting topic. So thank you very much for all of you for your support on this uh, open window. Okay, and thank please don't much. forget to fill out, fill out the, the survey uh, when you close uh, the webinar. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.